So it's now my very special privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. I've not known Shyla for long. I met her as we created this symposium. But wow, I immediately knew that we would hit it off because when I looked at what she had done, I said to myself, oh, she must be so naive. <laughs> of course, anyone who knows me knows that I say naivete is my strong suit. <laughs> it lets you do so many things that a person with more knowledge would never attempt. <laughs> Look at this. Charlotte is a trained operatic singer, operatic vocalist, who helped train this little Vermont band called Fish then decided she needed to unite the world in song as a way to bring healing, peace, and understanding between humanity and the earth. I mean, you all would like that idea, right? But Shyla didn't just like the idea. Shyla grabbed a convenient 14-inch glass globe and set off on a 99-day round-the-world trip, alone. Why not? What could possibly go wrong? Well, when you're naive, you don't ask that question. You ask, what could go right? And will this have a big enough impact? And who will do it if I don't? So she founded One Earth, One Voice Project, and off she went and succeeded at getting millions of people to unite in song on December 21st last year. There's another word for naive. It's not quite a synonym, but I think people often accidentally confuse the two words. I know I have. The other word is faith. I'm not sure Shyla knew that word when she set off on her trip. I know she knows it now that she's home. Shyla's work has been endorsed by many people, including Pete Sager, Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Bill McKibben, Sir Richard Branson, Indigenous Elder Chief Oren Lyons of the Onondaga. Um, you don't get a much more diverse group of people than that. As I know, as I've gotten to know Shyla, I have found what a wonderful human she is and how wonderfully human she is. And it's my pleasure to have her here. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Shyla. Good morning. Good morning. It's a brand new day. It really is a brand new day. I'm going to see if I can um, apply my aspiring geek capacities here. And we're going to open with um, a little video. Oh, 
Thank you very much. So I'd like to take the opportunity as things shift around a little bit on stage to first and foremost thank Jeff and Reverend Byron and the steering committee who invited me to participate in this extraordinary and historic gathering. My intuition told me right from the beginning that we will likely look back years hence from these two days together and we will remember everything that came out of this, everything that extended from the collective efforts, goodwill, and yes, faith of all of you being here. So again, from the bottom of my heart, I wanna thank Jeff, Reverend Byron, and the team uh, for the privilege of being with you today. Thank you very much. Yes, they do deserve a round of applause, please. And I will say to you that two days ago, I would have told you that I hail from Fair Brigadoon, which is the town of Charlotte, Vermont, where we have lots of covered bridges and a beautiful lake and lovely shores and rolling pastoral hillside and sweet farms that dot the landscape. And I would have told you, absolutely, I come from Brigadoon until I got here. And now I know what Brigadoon really is. I think I have fallen in love with the town of Stratford. I don't know how it is that, it, well, of course I know how it is that I could not have come here before because I haven't had an occasion to come here yet, although I have traveled extensively throughout this beautiful state. Uh, but the moment I came into this town, I can't even quite describe the feeling that came over me. So. Uh, to the community who are here and to my host, Lee, I want to thank you for welcoming me, for welcoming this symposium. You have something extraordinarily special here. I think you all know that, which makes it even more so. It's just beautiful. So thank you for, uh, for making me feel so welcome here. I also want to thank those who spoke yesterday, who were, as I like to say, voices of the earth. And we'll talk more about that over the course of our time this morning. Uh, Bill McKibben is a, is a cherished colleague and friend, and as some of you have heard, um, whatever planetary Gaiac memorandum came down Route 7 in 2008-2009, uh, we've got a related memo to, uh, to rise up a global community uh, on behalf of this planet and to, to try to, um, to attempt the impossible. And I have uh, long cherished uh, the, the dialogue between the two of us, and we do jokingly describe as Bill is the professional official bummer-outer. I'm the official cheerer-upper. So lovely book ending, and thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, and both are needed, and both are vitally needed. And uh, so I've very much enjoyed his colleagueship. And to the other presenters, uh, the Michael Mark, duo and everyone else, you know, Bruce and others who, who, who shared from their, the depth of, of one's own experience, uh, the, the intimacy to me of a symposium like this is that we were given the opportunity to toggle between the, the intimate faith journey, which is a, an intimate journey, and the outer expression of that journey, each in our own expertise, whether we're sculptors or scholars or activists, uh, each in our own way, allowing the opportunity for a kind of dissolving of that wall that often can be placed even in seemingly um, places where one would expect there could be integration, to, to really challenge us to become more courageous in allowing the inner and the outer to be integrated and to meet in our work. So I, uh, I thank you all for creating a beautiful current on which I hope my own message today can float and flow and continue this beautiful 
uh, dialogue and sharing that began so nobly and so beautifully and so eloquently yesterday. I'd like to take this opportunity as we begin our journey um, to, to dedicate, and if I can get through this without crying, it'll be a miracle, but hey, um, dedicate this to my two daughters, Emily and Sophia, uh, 17 and 15. Everything I do in my work is for them. And I know I stand here in the midst of others who would stand shoulder to shoulder with me with every bit as much dedication. So for my Emily and Sophia and for all the Emilys and Sophias and Davids and Joshuas and Brendans of the world, whoever, for the future generations, that is precisely in whose Who's, at whose behest I am here, I've consecrated my life to them. I answer to them. So thank you for creating a container that allows for that to be voiced with as much clarity as you have done uh, by creating this gathering. I also would like to take a moment in quietude to presence ourselves with one another, to honor every voice that is here today, every story that is held within each individuated human being in this room, the stories of those whose lives we touch, to take a moment of pause. And in that pause, feel the presence of those around you and the presence of those who may not be in physical presence today with us, but are very much with us in spirit. And I will gently ask that in that silence, may my voice become a true voice of the earth on her behalf today. Thank you. We have an axiom in our circle, uh, and that is what's personal is planetary. What's planetary is personal. In other words, the individual lives of each one of us are a microcosmic reflection of the story not only of the Earth, but a story really of the cosmos. And in this, I I um, nobly honor uh, the work of Thomas Berry and uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker, who spoke yesterday in her work and bringing his voice into the wider world on, 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 for all of our benefit. Every human being's story contains within it a facet of the story of Earth. And in that spirit, I'll share a little bit of my personal story and honor with gratitude those who did so yesterday as well. And then tell you a story of how we got to this 14-inch diameter glass globe in 99 days around the planet. <laughs> There's a relationship, of course. So as I like to say, uh, I was actually raised in a, um, a second-generation radical family. I was raised atheist, and as I like to say, thank God I was raised atheist. <laughs> Best thing that could have happened. And yet I always had some kind of mystical predisposition, as my family would tell you, uh, with some nervousness that was, don't really quite know what that was. We lived in a neighborhood. I grew up in an academic family, fiercely brilliant political family, uh, peace activists. I was marching in peace protests before I could actually walk. Um, and I, we lived near this beautiful, magical place that I would go to as a child. And again, no religious what's, you know, any context whatsoever, but I would go to this magical place, and there was this statue of this lady in white, like this white stone statue, with her hands folded, and she had these long robes, and she, and she would look like this. And there were these beautiful white stones all around the, the foot of the statue, and I would sit at the, f at the feet of this statue and look up at this beautiful lady. 
And I loved her. I had no idea who she was, but I loved her. And I would talk to the statue, and I'd you know, play with the stones, and there were all these wonderful, soft-spoken women who all wore the exact same outfit <laughs> that was kind of royal blue, and you know, had this kind of th the white thing here and long, and it came down to about here, and then they all wore the same long kind of blue dresses. And they, and they would always come to me, hello, it's so lovely to see you again, and how are you? And I, had, I just loved them. And, and so this was my magical land, and it was you know, a bike ride from where I lived. And so I would go as often as I could and go sit at the statue and hope that I would see the, lady, the blue ladies, the blue ladies. Well, unbeknownst to me, it was the Sisters of Mercy and Trinity College. And it was the statue of Mary, of course. Whatever that sensibility, there was a deep connection even then as a child to, to my experience with them, my experiences at the foot of that statue, and my experiences exploring the woods behind my house, where I found clay deposits and, you know, you know, rocks that looked like they had some kind of, you know, mystical story behind them and pine cones and, you know, all those the wonderful discoveries of childhood and, you know, ascribing to every one of those objects, you know, some, some kind of magical property and cultivating them and collecting them and sharing them with my friends and bringing my friends with me into the wilds of our forest. And, you know, it was just an incredibly magical experience. And for me, without having any uh, religious context, there was a deep understanding of some kind of relationship there that I didn't, I didn't understand. Little did I know that what those experiences were cultivating in me were really the seedbed for what has become my life's work. I began singing professionally at the age of 17. I have loved singing my whole life. And began um, singing in my community and uh, First and foremost, actually took up the Baroque repertoire, which I love to sing very much, and it was in that uh, under th in that context that I began my professional singing career. I had been raised singing along with Pete Seeger and Peter Paul and Mommy, <laughs> and harmonizing with them, and you know. Imagine my delight to be able to work collegially both with Pete Seeger and also uh, to sing with Peter Yarrow, as I have over the years a few times. Uh, just an incredible delight. But my voice is really a classical voice. Always has been. I wanted to have a voice like Bonnie Raitt. <laughs> I really did. But you know, the voice does what the voice does. And, even, and Bonnie actually now knows that, which is an even funnier story. But anyway, um, I really did. But anyway, this, you know. We, we receive what we receive, right? The gifts that we receive. Um, so at 17, I began my career. And at 19 years old, um, I entered a period of, uh, from 19 to 20, which one might consider the, um, I guess, a dark night of the soul. I survived a violent crime at the age of 19 and was violently choked as part of that. And the psychological and physical trauma combined resulted in the full loss of my voice at 19. I entered into a period of um, essentially being at war with my body as a result of the trauma and stopped eating, essentially went on what might, one might consider a, uh, an emotional hunger strike and um, became very, very dangerously ill. Um, if you can imagine about 30 to 35 pounds less on this frame than today. And uh, had a coming out of that kind of downward spiral uh, on September 11th, 1988. Had a near death experience in a hospital bed in Orlando, Florida. And any of you who have either experienced or know others who have experienced uh, near death experience, uh, it's, I'm, I'm astonished at the universality. Um, I did have a tunnel of light experience. I did not have any interaction with any presences, uh, personally that, you know, my own story, but there was a pause. There was a pause and a, a, just a, a moment. I, time suspends in such experiences. And I remember 
being essentially magnetically pulled and reversed. And the next thing I know, I felt the weight of my limbs literally in the most acute way against the bed in which I was lying. Back. September 11th, 1988. So this September 11th marks the 25th anniversary of that holy day. My journey to into a recovery process was um, arduous. I had a lot to rework in terms of my physical health, and I had lost the ability to phonate in any meaningful way. And intuitively, I somehow knew that the only real hope I had to reclaim my voice was to return to the place where I had found it in the first place, which for me was back in those woods, in the wilds of my childhood, where I sang and gathered stones in the pine cones and to return there. I had no idea what exactly I was doing, nor did I know anything about the science that I now understand, and some of you here likely know. There is an actual science to the role of the electrons in the electromagnetic field of the Earth in mitigating immune, uh, inflammatory responses in the body. And I would go into the woods completely unbeknownst to me, any of that. And I would just intuitively kick off my shoes and I'd stand in the hummus of the forest floor and I'd put my hands on trees. And I, mystical child, would feel for what I would describe as the tone of the tree and try in some way to bring my voice to that tone. I have no idea what I was doing. There's an entire health practice in Japan that is dedicated to helping people heal through pra practices almost identical to that. I had no idea. And I honked like a goose the first few times. I literally sounded like a honking goose. And I would cry, and I'd try to make sound, and I would cry again, and just do it again, and again, and again, and again. Until one day, I actually sustained a tone, one tone. And the next day, I could actually inflect the pitch up and down ever so slightly, ever so slightly. And day by day, week by week, I began to be able to find my voice again. So here's my contract with this planet. Here's my contract with the rest of my life. I believe with every fiber of my being that the earth herself literally gave me back my voice so that I might be an advocating voice on her behalf at a time of critical need. That's my gig. End stop. Thank you. Thank you. And in that spirit, allow me to offer to you a gift from her through me.
Thank you, thank you. So fast forward, 2009. I'm now coaching internationally, uh, working internationally, both as, a, as an opera singer and also as a, a voice coach, working with people who use their voices, speakers, uh, rock musicians, um, others who, uh, you know, I call it high demand vocal use. You know, people who are actually, you know, literally wor working at a very high level, very demanding uh, work with their voices. And my daughters and I were in Los Angeles, actually, on the morning of Earth Day 2009. And I was there to coach some of my clients in, um, in that place they call Hollywood. And um, the night before, we had been out, and somewhere along the way, we had seen off in the distance um, some kids playing soccer with garbage on the, on the street as we were coming back to our hotel. And I actually didn't consciously, I mean, I saw it, I noted it, it went in somewhere. The following morning, an idea that had been in gestation for probably about three years was front and center. Earth Day, good morning. I was on the West Coast, obviously, and I woke up with a shot at probably five or six o'clock that morning. And I went into prayer and tried to, you know, tune into what was, what is this, what is this, what is this that I'm noting? And a little while later, a few hours later, I got it. And it was the gestation of what we called the Good Earth Singers, which was really an idea to gather people in community, particularly in Vermont, uh, which is, you know, Brigadoon, where I was living in Charlotte at the time, and um, gather people for the purpose of community building and singing, no auditions, no music like, you know, papers of music, no performance intention, but to get people singing songs in celebration of the earth from all over the world. And we would have a potluck, as we in New England do, for community gatherings, potluck and singing. Sent out this invitation to my mailing list and lo and behold, less than an hour later, I had received responses from South Africa, Argentina, Israel, Australia. It went on and on and on. And I literally sat at my laptop and sobbed as email after email came in. We were a global movement in less than an hour. And the responses that I received were heartfelt. I have felt so hopeless. I have felt so powerless to do anything. You've given us something to do. You know, even if it's just a start, you've given us something to do. How can we become part of this? May 23rd, 2009 was our inaugural gathering at the Congregational Church in Charlotte, Vermont, of course, Vermont. And we had people already synchronized to gather in their own communities in spirit with us. We received a beautiful uh, message of blessing from Paul Winter, who's also a dear friend and colleague and um, supporter and ally of this campaign. And we gathered and we sang. We broke bread together and we sang. We sang songs from Israel. We sang songs from Russia. We sang songs from South Africa. And we sang this song from the Yoruba, who are distributed primarily among the countries of Nigeria and Ghana, 40 million strong worldwide. And I have to say that the moment we started singing that song, the molecules in the air changed, and everybody there that night felt it. The tears, 
started to flow, and we just built this song, and we built the harmonies, and we built and built, and it was a, a moment of great wonder for us all. And it happened again, and again, and again, and again. Every single time we sang that song, in any context, there it was. Just this, there was something about this song. Was it its simplicity? Was it its structure? Was it its message? We didn't quite know. Along the way, we joined with 350. We had song circles doing actions with the 350. You know, there were lots of confluences, you know, weaving in and out, people singing, you know, like the, you know, to the Tata Dajos, the, ang you know, for those of you who heard Reverend Bry uh, Byron yesterday, you know, the, the, the angry Onondaga leader who was healed by song. You know, we've, we've had people staging actions through song uh, in various places. So this began to happen. In addition, we became aware that there was an interesting opportunity presented to us as we carried the story of Earth through song. Song lines carry the collective wisdom of humanity. And the Aborigine communities talk about what it means to sing up the song lines of the Earth, which is both about singing up the story of Earth and also the story of humanity in relation to the Earth. Last December 21st, 2012, as many of you know, marked in, in there, you know, all kinds of scholarly parsings about this, but we'll go with it. December 21st, 2012, marked in one way or another the completion of a long-standing ancient Mayan cycle, 26,000 years in the making. And astrophysics actually bears out that that was actually, they were right on, you know, in terms of understanding that we were entering a new positioning, if you will, in relationship to our cosmos. So, ra and as you all know, there were all kinds of doom and gloom prognostications and, you know, all of the things that we might expect when these major time thresholds are crossed. We saw it as an opportunity. The opportunity was to remind us all through song, through collective action, of our intrinsic humanity, our shared humanity, and the fragility our earth and our relationship, the delicacy of that relationship. So I've had the privilege of working over these last few years with a team of about 30 people internationally who are environmental leaders, spiritual leaders, indigenous elders, young aspiring environmentalists, young voices, artists, world musicians. And together we came up with a plan. And the plan was that there would be a journey that I would take, which essentially ran a song line around the world to raise up a global choir, to sing, to mark this time threshold, and to sing in healing of the earth. So what song would we pick? Well, it may seem obvious to you, but I really had to kind of, I really went through a process of what song, what song, what song? And it was actually in a visit with Pete Seeger that we had this very funny conversation about the relationship between the climate crisis, which as he would tell you if he were standing here with me, is the cause of our time. A man who has stood in the trenches of every single human rights effort on planet Earth for the nearly 100 years that he's been here, would tell you the climate issue is the cause of our time. And he shared with me, as a grandfather to a granddaughter, if you will, the story of how it is that We Shall Overcome became the anthem of the civil rights movement. He was obviously there in the room, filled with musicians in a, in a gym in New York, when there was a whole jam session of musicians singing songs, We Shall Not Be Moved, you know, all of these songs that came out of the civil rights movement. And there was a moment where they introduced this song, which had originally been a very upbeat Baptist hymn called I'll Be All Right, which has this really, you know, great backbeat, I'll be all right. That's how it starts. Somebody slowed it down, changed the words to We Shall Overcome. And in that room, as he describes it, every single person knew this is it. This is the anthem for our movement. Those of you who walked the streets, and I know that there are some here who did, who sang that song with Reverend King and others, know what happens when human voices come together in song. 
there is something that happens. And we have all kinds of, amazingly, we have science that can now actually show us. Don't you love the science? I just love, it's just, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a closet aspiring geek. I love it. All this information about what it is about the human voice connecting to other human voices and training to other human voices, harmonizing with other human voices. The effect on the nervous system, the effect on the circulatory system, the effect on our overall sense of health and well-being, the effect on our ability to feel like we're part of the human family, that we're connected to each other, which in turn reflects back our connection to ourselves and, dare I say it, to the earth, the source of all of our life. So Pete knew that. I got that. And as soon as he started telling me that story, I thought, oh, well, that's, that's pretty obvious then. We know exactly which song is ours. <laughs> Gotta be Ishi Oluwa. It seems to make people cry every time we do it. So that's how Ishi Oluwa kind of emerged organically out of our movement. Well, now, Ishi Oluwa is not, you know, a pop tune. Uh, it's also not in English, which I won't get into my own personal predisposition, but I'm actually glad uh, it's not, just in terms of our relationship to the rest of the world. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful song. The words are, and you're going to be singing it uh, shortly, Ishe Oluwa Kole Ba Jeo. That's it. Translation into English is, that which the creator has made can never be destroyed. Now whether you come at that from thermodynamics 101, <laughs> or from a deep theological understanding of the sanctity of the creation, and the intimate interconnection, as we talked about yesterday, between creator and creation. However you come at that, we resonate at the core to that truth. And even without knowing the translation, people get it. So how beautiful. So I knew one thing. As a dyed-in-the-wool New England wasp, I couldn't just say, oh, I'll take this song around the world and teach everybody this song without honoring its origin, which meant for me traveling to the Yoruba elders who are appropriately centered in Yoruba land, in Abiyakuta, which is the center of the Yoruba world. Uh, risky journey, necessary journey, to go to receive their blessing. And in that, to anchor the intention to then carry their song as a voice of the earth all the way around the world to 14 locations that had been identified by my team, the young environmentalists, the veteran environmentalists, the indigenous elders and thought leaders who were part of our team. We came up with a list of 14 locations and I became in a way a human stethoscope to go location by location location by location, and teach the song where I could. In some parts of the world, I was not able to speak or sing publicly. And we had sort of clandestine meetings with, you know, the Grammy award-winning Egyptian Fatih Salama, you know, in Cairo. And we have this on film, you know, of me teaching Ishe Oluwa two blocks from Tahrir Square to Fatih Salama, who then sang, they sang it in Tahrir Square on December 21st. So wherever we had to, culturally, I did what I needed to do to get the song line threaded. And I also was there to tell the story of Earth in each of these places. Cairo is considered the most polluted city in the world today, has outpaced Mexico City. And I want to take a moment and just ask that we hold the people of Cairo and the people of Egypt. Every time I see the images, these children, I carry this glass globe into Tahrir Square and I was thronged by children. First of all, they got that I'm an American. I did have my hair back, but I wasn't, you know, wrapped. And they got I was American. W who else but an American would carry a 14-inch glass globe around the earth? I mean, let's be honest about that, first of all. And they, they loved the globe. And we have, we have images after image of these beautiful children in Tahrir Square holding the globe. And also little film footage that I also shot throughout the journey of people in their own language. So we have these children in Tahrir Square saying, we are the voice of the earth in Arabic. You know, 
you know, people in Taipei, we are the voice of the earth in Mandarin. It's just a you know, this kind of beautiful montage of the human story. What does the earth want to say about herself over these 99 days? That was my prayer. So a couple of snapshots from the journey, in addition to those. I started the journey in Washington, and I headed north to Onondaga Territory. Lots to say about that, but suffice it to say, the Onondaga are the midwives of the American government as in its purest form. George Washington knew. We don't know what we're doing. We just managed to defeat the British Empire. Now what? And he had the good sense to go to the Onondaga and sit in the longhouse and sit at the feet of the elders who taught him about leadership. I went to Onondaga territory and with Orrin Lyons, uh, one of my cherished advisors, we went up to Aquasasna to Mohawk Nation for a climate adaptation conference, the first of its kind, gathering indigenous elders from all of North America and the climate adaptation team of the, uh, the EPA and the Canadian Environmental Protection Agency. Extraordinary gathering, and we, of course, sang, and uh, we also had ceremony up there. And from there, I proceeded down to New York City. Now, I've got the glass globe at this point. This is day, you know, three, four, five, six. I get to New York City. There's one little practical problem, which is I'm about to head overseas, and I don't have a case for the 14-inch globe. <laughs> so how am I going to carry this thing, right? You know, cart, crate, box, I don't know. And this is actually keeping me up at night at this point, you know, <laughs> like, how am I going to get through security? I can't check this thing, because honestly, we know, right, what would happen. So how am I going to do this? So I get to New York City, staying at the home of Rabbi Rachel Cohen, Cowan, wonderful woman, and I um, have a plan to go to St. John the Divine that Sunday, which is the last Sunday that I'm on continental U.S. soil before the journey begins. And for those of you who don't know, St. John is a, an earth haven of magnitude. And um, I, of course, brought the glass globe, and the intention was we were also going to take photos. Some of the photos from the video came from that day. And I, um, I was there for liturgy, and I sat kind of close to the front, you know, near th in the sacristy, and um, I had the glass globe in a bag that uh, Rabbi Rachel had loaned me. It's a little, you know, Samsonite bag. So here I'm walking through the streets of New York. I go to St. John. I've got the globe in a bag sitting right by my feet, and an empty seat between myself and the woman who was sitting on, on you know, nearby. And in the mo there was a moment I was sitting in this hallowed, space and they're just beginning to prepare for communion and I got that kind of inner prompting to take the glass globe out of the bag and set it on the seat next to myself and you know between myself and this other woman so doing what I was prompted to do I set it down and the priests who were presiding over the preparation saw it. And they looked. <laughs> <laughs> it's New York City, you know, anything could be going on there. And suddenly recognized what it was. It was a glass earth. And all of a sudden, the tears started to flow. I had known somehow that in addition to the power of song, what we were invoking, if you will, is the power of symbol. What unifying symbol, what unifying object could we bring as a kind of Olympic torch to also symbolize the message of this movement without that transcended culture, that transcended language, that transcended religious ideology, that transcended all of those different things that we think divide us. What would be the one thing that would just give us that visceral, yeah, I get it, glass globe? So, there we were. It was time for me to go up to receive communion. And... Um, I took the globe with me, carried it in my arms, and the entire clergy wept. And when it was time for me to receive communion, of course, because my hands were full, 
received it, ve- you know, in that very intimate sort of dispensation. And the woman who is the priest presiding, the celebrant of the morning, in a st- utterly spontaneous gesture, laid her hands on the globe and poured forth completely from the depth of her being a prayer for the safety, health, and well-being of our earth. And I just, she wept, I wept, we just stood there, and I just, I could feel this cascading warmth of her love and her prayer just going right into the very core of the earth in that moment. And I turned around after she was complete, and I walked back to my seat, and one by one, every other priest just gently touched my shoulder in a blessing. And I sat back down, and I heard a little message, still small voice, that said, this is how you're going to carry this now. In your arms, every day, around the world for the rest of the journey. And that is precisely what I did. No protection but my own arms. No bag, no padding. Through every security checkpoint in every major airport on the planet. (laughs) Confronting. (laughs) You saw we got the TSA in there, right? I mean, hey. And the Nigerian airport security and the, I mean, it was, you know, and every, it was like this whole dance. You can only imagine. I was confronted by machine guns at one airport um, and, and a gentleman who said to me, there's no way, you know, there's no way. This was in Nigeria as I was leaving the country. There's no way you're going to get that thing through here. There's no way. And I smiled. <laughs> I said, it goes with me. No, 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 no. This is a big man, big machine gun. No, this goes with me. And I carried one shoulder bag and two outfits for the entire journey, one pair of shoes, and that was it for 99 days. And so that's what I had, my shoulder bag, my globe, me. And um, he said, you're going to have to leave that here with me and go back to get some kind of clearance from the airline. Well, that didn't feel quite right to me. I thought, "Mm, I'm not so sure about leaving it with it. And I thought, what a beautiful metaphor. Like, leave the earth with the military guy with the big gun and go. I thought, you know, I just can't quite, with all due respect, I can't quite go there. You know, I had gotten this other phrase when I was at St. John, which was living liturgy. These 99 days were a living liturgy. What would it mean for me to put my life fully at the service of the story of earth as a living liturgy every day? So here I am with this wonderful opportunity. I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I hopped up on the, on the security table. You know, this guy was not going to let me go, and he was not going to let me do anything with that globe. I said, leave it there. And I said, well then, I guess you've just got yourself a new best friend. <laughs> he looked at me, thinking, who's the... I'm the only white person, little and white woman in the whole airport. Who's the white woman with the juju, like, (laughs) don't know what that's all about. Anyway, there we were, sat there, and I thought, okay, let us pray. (laughs) That's what I did. I went right into prayer, and I thought, well, something will happen. I'm either going to be, you know, cast off into some dark room, never to be seen again, or something else. Sure enough, one of the airline workers came by, and I said, excuse me, I need to get some kind of clearance from the airline to, you know, take this, you know, may I take this back with me to the desk to do that? And he said, well, of course, (laughs) of course. The military guy looked a little, (laughs) so there I go. I carried it back, got got the clearance, and came back through. And when I came back through, I smiled at him, and his face radiated warmth. And he wished me well on my journey. And to me, that you know, these snapshot moments, countless snapshots like this, remind me in those moments, this man could have, I, I could not be here today as a result. If a thing had gone another way, I wouldn't be standing on this stage. But there's something about being able to just be present in that moment, to cluck like a rooster under the table, whatever it takes to just presence. 
in a simple present thing, human being to human being, something can happen. So, one little snapshot, uh, one other little snapshot. Uh, Cairo. I was there for the Festival of Aid, the high Muslim holiday, and um, walked the streets of Cairo with an entourage who were there for security. And um, I came across some children who um, are what we call the garbage pickers. And I want to ask you to hold, as we prepare to sing now, um, an image of these children who race to me to take a look at this glass globe, which was a magical orb to them. And they got what it was, and they said to me, fragile earth in Arabic. And I offered it to them to hold. They had come down off of a 15-foot high pile of refuse, which are rampant in Cairo. The sanitation system is essentially non-effective at this point. Their job, as you know, is to pick through garbage every day. That's their job, no schooling. That's their role in our human family. Imagine, if you will, these two radiant children, probably four and six years old, holding the glass globe, smiling, and behind them, this 15-foot high pile of refuse. I sing for them. As much as I sing for my own children, I sing for them. And I invite you to join me in singing for them. Now, one last critical detail of this story before we sing. I returned to Vermont. We continued the journey of this globe. We have wonderful photos with Bernie Sanders, Bill McKibben, others who have been photographed with the globe. And on the first new moon, following the first solstice, June, following the great turning of that 26,000-year cycle, something happened. I had the globe in the back of my wagon with secure footing, or so I thought, and went to uh, help a friend open up the back of my wagon. Whew. Out came the globe, shattered into a thousand, thousand pieces on the ground. I stood in frozen silence for minutes, utterly shocked. This globe has been blessed by indigenous elders and the waters of the earth, from the Nile to the Celtic Sea, everywhere. And then I realized, oh, the shattering of the old earth and time to create a new earth. This is the very first time I have spoken publicly about what happened to our beloved glass globe. I let Jeff know that I would be making a critical announcement. <laughs> In the same way that I was invited to carry this globe with reverence all around the earth, I was invited to pick up the shards on my hands and knees in a friend's driveway the bowl that you see is the bowl that I used to do that. They have not left this bowl since that day. It's a bowl that was created by Vermont potter Miranda Thomas. It is a tree of life bowl. And I got down on my hands and knees sobbing and thought, how beautiful. There are other larger pieces that are here as well. To put the shards of the old earth back into the tree of life and create a new earth. So in September, you'll be getting an invitation soon. In September, the beautiful glass blowers of AO Glass in Burlington, who created the original globe, we are going to have a special event in which we ceremonially take all the shards of the old globe, the old earth, and fire them in with some new molten glass, and we will bring forth a new earth. And you will all be invited to join us, and of course there will be singing. As the day progresses today, we're going to be inviting each of you to, to be video recorded if you feel so moved, offering whatever blessing you feel moved to, a blessing of the old earth, and to voice on film what it is that you see 
as the elements of the new earth in whatever way you're moved to do so. So we will let you know more about that as the day progresses, but I just wanted you to know that. Um, our mission from here is this. We're getting ready to rise up singing again. And we are going to be singing every December 21st, and we're going to be singing in every country, every community, every place we possibly can. It is the same song. We will bring it forth time, time, time again. We're now working with the United Nations. Our intention is as follows. We intend to ask the UN General Assembly to set aside December 21st as a day of non-violence against the earth. That is our call. And we hope in turn to evolve that into a resolution, asking country by country for commitments of the same, however might be defined country by country. So more on that as the weeks progress, as we prepare to uh, relaunch our campaign in 2013. Now, in the time that we have remaining, I'm going to invite you all to rise up singing. And I'm going to invite you then to take the song line to your families, to your communities, to any and everybody, take it to the streets, take it to the tadadahos, the, you know, take it to those who need it the most. Take this song with you. Gather yourselves. Join us in raising up a true voice for the earth, united and strengthened by its diversity and by its singularity of purpose. So if I could invite you to please stand. I'm going to invite you to say the words with me. Ishe Oluwa. Kole Banje O. Beautiful. Ishe Oluwa. Kole Banje O. Beautiful. Those of you who already know it, please join me. I'm going to go ahead and start the process of singing, and then we're going to just take a little bit of section by section and introduce some harmonies. If you're already harmoniously inclined, go for it. The more the merrier. All right? So here's how it goes. Ishe Oluwa Kole Banje O Ishe Oluwa Kole Banje O Then three times Kole Banje O Kole Banje O Kole Beautiful. Cole Bajeo. Cole Bajeo. Cole Bajeo. Keep going. He shay sopranos no lua sopranos cole bajeo he shay lua beautiful cole bajeo yes Keep going, Sopranos, beautiful. Kole Bajeo Ishe Oluwa Kole Bajeo Good, now tenors, join me here. Kole Bajeo Kole Bajeo Beautiful. Kole
got your parts. Now bases, you've got an easy one here. Cole baje o. Don't move from that note. Cole baje o. Great tenors. Cole baje o. Cole baje o. Ishe. Beautiful. Holua. Build it. Cole yes. Cole Cole Last time. Ishe. Thank you, thank you. There are those who would say we're half an hour behind. I think we're half an hour ahead. <laughs> I knew Charlotte would be a good start for the day. I had no idea. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. We are, we are very grateful.